Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by Change Labs. My name is Marsha Grayeyes, and I'm the community manager for Change Labs. Um, Change Labs is a nonprofit organization. It's dedicated to helping grow tribal businesses on reservation lands. Uh, Change Labs, we provide opportunities for you to network, learn, and grow your business. Change Labs offers five programs to assist entrepreneurs. The programs are resident designer, co-working, business incubator, doing business, and kinship lending. Our resident designer this year is Mariah Ashley. She consults with uh, members of the cohort and the business community to help them develop their website. And she also uses other visual communication tools to help you launch your business online. We also have the co-working space, which is located in Tuba City, Arizona. We're open from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. You can access Wi-Fi, use our Cricut machine, printer, or rent our pop-up pod for the day. Um, you, if you would like more information, you can email me at marsha at nativestartup.org. In here. Our other program is the Business Incubator. It is a year-long program where we work with 10 businesses to start and grow their businesses. At the end of the program, the businesses are eligible to apply for a microloan through Native Co-op Capital. Uh, another one of our programs is Kinship Lending. Our Kinship Lending program was born out of necessity amid the pandemic. We were looking for ways to assist tribal businesses during the, these uncertain times. So far since March, we've made over 30 loans to Navajo and Hopi businesses in the Four Corners area. Um, at Change Labs, our goal is to help you overcome barriers to starting a business on the reservation. We continue to look for ways to enhance the ease of doing business on the reservation. We also have a, an app called Res Rising. You can download it onto your mobile device. It lists um, native owned businesses so you can support one another by being aware of and using the products and services of other native owned businesses. Uh, every Monday we provide 90 minute coaching, uh, business coaching opportunities to you. You can sign up at nativestartup.org slash events. Um, these are our business coaches here. There's nine of us. Uh, we feature a different business coach every week. So depending on what their expertise are, you can read the little blurb for whoever signed up for that, the upcoming Monday. We also ask for your support by signing our peti petition to clean up uh, abandoned BIA buildings. Uh, you can sign the petition at nativestartup.org forward slash BIA cleanup or find us on change.org. And now for our featured presentation by Darlene Navajo. I'd like to turn this time over to her. Darlene has worked in the grant writing sector for over 30 years. Today she will help us learn the who, what, where, and when of grant writing. Darlene. Yeah, day. Good morning. I'm Darlene. I am the sole proprietor of my company. I decided on a title of one Indian and associates. I have been in consulting now for over eight years. The previous seven were with an, in a partnership called Traditional Eagle Solutions based out of Omaha, Nebraska. And over those seven years, we worked with tribes across the nation writing various different grants. And before that, I was working for the Ponca Tribe of Nebraska as a CEO, various grant director positions. And before moving to Nebraska, I worked for the Navajo Nation, worked with the Navajo Housing Authorities years ago, and ran the renovation program. Before that, I worked with social services with the um, Social Services Health and Human Services Grant Program, their planning department. So, my background has been varied, but over the years I've seen how grant writing and grant funding really can impact our communities. And these days, more of what we do as big business owners and um, community action people, where we can find funding. So I'm really excited to 
to share what I've learned and I'm hoping that it is helpful information for you. And uh, so let's get started with the PowerPoint and thank you this morning. Uh, creator, I wanted to say thank you to the Creator for letting us be here and being able to join this virtual, share this virtual space. Let's get started. So we are going to cover the who, what, where, and when of grant writing. And one of the things that's not included in those W's is why. So I would like to ask for your participation from the very beginning. Type in your why you're participating in this webinar. Um, the, the screenshot has a picture on there and it's, uh, it's my interpretation of, of the darkness is the problem that we see um, and we're inspired at some point to create change. So we have this faith, this hope that we can make an impact. And then we think, if only I had the money. So I'll ask you why, why you would like to learn more information about grant writing. And then we'll talk about, go on to talk about who, who should write the grant, what does the grant process include, where do you find the grant opportunities, and when is the best time to pursue funding. So when we talk, we want to talk about who, we'll, we'll come back to the why in the, near the end of the presentation, so we'll, we'll come back and circle around. But when we're talking about the who, the first two that you may think about, I was talking about the writer. But the other who in this equation is the granting agency. And who are you going to pursue and, and to know what their goals and objectives are and why they have money available and who they're willing to um, consider for awards. So the other who that I was talking about first was, I'm hoping you, that you're thinking of writing a grant or that you're thinking of an employee that you need to write a grant or maybe a consultant to help you. And even if there's a whole team that can get together, I really appreciated a team approach and, and that can be very beneficial, but it also is very cumbersome in, in um, when you're looking at communication styles and personality. So if we all know our role, we all know what we need to do by what time, then that's a really good team that can work together. There may be other, other sources of grant writing that you may be aware of that I'm not. Those are the main ones that I have worked with. So when we're talking about who would be a good grant writer, I'll just throw in a couple of ideas about who would be a good grant writer. What makes a good grant writer is they have passion for the project. It might be the person who is willing to put in the time as your main contact person for the project. And they want their, their hands on. They say, I want to do this project. Or you say, I want to do this project. I want to, I want to plan it. I want to lead it. I want to be the one to see it rolled out. So that's the passion that needs to be conveyed in writing when you're writing a grant. You also need to put a little tug at those heartstrings of the grantee, granting agency so that when they're reading this, they feel it here, they feel it in their heart. The other part of it is not so emotional, but you need someone who can do some research. Um, a psychology journal about the emotions that are involved, the data find, the data that you can find that help to provide supporting facts on what you're going to change or you're proposing to change. Something that conveys this is what it is now and these are the things that are changing in your story and this is according to the journals and the articles and the facts. The Department of Justice has a lot of great um, frequently asked questions or um, data sheets that show the current domestic violence numbers, violence, you know, records, different things. The Department of Health has current health data about our current health situation and 
we do this, this is what's going to change. So those are the facts that I'm talking about. Those are the research um, skills that someone needs to have that's doing this writing. And the person that's doing the writing should, should love to write and expect to write, rewrite, and, and create that flow throughout their document. Even the finalizing of the document, the narrative, I think that that writer would really appreciate, should, I'll say should, because not all writers like to be critiqued, but the writer should appreciate and blend in someone that's going to come in and proofread and help them edit their story and, and build into it. So in the little black box, I talk about the who, and I had mentioned personalities but when you're creating a team or you're just having another person working with you on a grant, know their personality. Know if they're a morning person and if they're a, a night owl so that you're not conflicting time. You're like, I told you to get this and I haven't heard from you. Well, at three, two o'clock in the morning, you're not answering their email if they're the night owl. And if you're an early person and you get up and you go, oh gosh, they were working on this. I need to get this done and get it done in the morning and then you sit there and wait until they're up the next night. So know those personality differences and figure out how they can be the strengths of that team. And then also be aware of the timing in your grant writing grant period. So those are the I guess the lessons learned in the little black box is know the personalities, know your strengths and what you can bring to the grant writing team and always be cognizant of the time. How much time do we have left? What do we need to get done when? What is the basic process and parts of a grant? So I have these initial steps of the process and it begins with that idea. You see a need, you identify a need, you get an idea, and a project starts formulating in our brain. You start thinking that there's something I can do about this, and I, I want to develop a program, I want to develop a new service, and then you start outlining it. You start looking at maybe this would cost me um, funding a, a position, some supplies and maybe some community stuff and maybe a vehicle and it, it all starts gelling in your your brain and you start writing it down and so you take it to your decision makers or those within your organization that have the authority to say yeah let's invest some time in this and we'll give you authority we'll support you you can take time to start developing this come back and let us know when you're done. Um, let us review it. Let us give you final approval, they may say. And then they give you the authority to start working on it. Or you give yourself the authority to start working on it and put aside time because then it's, you start to invest time and you start, you start creating that investment. And if time is money, then that's your money that you're starting to put into this project just by the minutes that you start spending on planning, creating, and thinking, and start drafting these documents. So if you identify a funding opportunity, then you really start the grant writing process. You start drafting a grant budget. You write the narrative. You develop supporting documents and attachments. And we'll go over each of these in more detail. You edit and revise and finalize your grant application. Then there's an, a final approval. Whether you have to go back to your board or your decision makers, your leadership to obtain that final approval is probably very um, dependent upon what type of organization or business, community organization you may, may be working with or your own your own final thought that, okay, now it's done. I feel good. This is going to be done. And you submit it in the timely fashion. And hopefully not a minute before or seconds before it's due at some ungodly midnight hour, 
in the correct time zone. So that's an overview of not only the, the idea process, but the actual grant writing steps. And hopefully you hear back shortly after that, that there's a grant award. So what we're really looking at is how do we get the money? So when you're looking for a grant, app a grant application or grant instructions, what really explains what you need to do for the grant writing portion? And what does their grant application look like? So there are different things, the three main areas that are that make up the what. What guides the grant writing? What should a grant application include? And what are the grant requirements? So we'll look at these three parts. So what guides grant writing? And usually they're called guiding instructions, application instructions, grant instructions. It could be most often called one of these three. ANOVA, notice of funding available, a request for applications, or a funding opportunity announcement. And within those instructions, this in the gold highlight are the parts of this instruction. They'll explain who's eligible for this funding. They will explain and give you the application deadline. This will include the time zone, down to the minute, and what date. If there are any questions, they will provide contact information. They will provide an application format. They will explain how you apply, whether it's online, whether they need still need paper copies. There are still some organizations that do. Maybe it's just the one online page. Whatever their process is, that's where they will identify. And then they have award information. They, they give us a little bit award information saying, if you are a winner, and we all want to be winners, if you are awarded a grant, this is what you are going to have to agree to. So before you even apply, you need to pay attention to that. What are we agreeing to? They will often provide resource lists, and then depending on their grant announcement, they'll include other information. So that's just a brief overview of what instructions, what their, their packet of instructions may include. So that was just like the, the overview of what this whole packet includes. So you break down the actual, what should be included in the grant application. And normally, these are the items here, a cover sheet, a letter or a project profile, a narrative, a timeline, a budget, and there's this match. It's, uh, some agencies or funding, funders may require you to match them dollar for dollar. Some may just be, it may be based on a percentage. And some may not require that, and those are my favorite. There may be a process of evaluation that they require those that are given money to say, okay, you go this far, you need to show us that you're successful. That you're doing what you're doing, you're making the impact at each quarter. And normally it's a quarterly evaluation. So you design those tools and you make a baseline measurement and track and tick off how much success to reflect the success of the program to show the funder that you, you're doing good things with their money. They may require you to show proof that you have the authority to, authority to apply. And that would be, if you're a tribal organization, there might be a council resolution. If it's an oversight as the board, they may ask for a board document. And um, if you're a business, it might just be a signed letter from the business president. They also give you a list of disclosures whether or not you're a company that's been high risk, and that's more of a technical term, being a high risk as a federal grantor. And they, they maintain lists of those, 
online. You can you can Google high risk and you may be on a list or not you, but hopefully not us. Neither of us will ever be on that high risk list. But if you if the organization is, then they're tracking it. So they, they want you to disclose and be upfront about that. They also want to know if you have other funding applications that might be duplicating or overlapping. But in those situations, they want you to, to be upfront about it and say, but this is how it's going to be funding different things, but together. They need disclosure of lobbying to make sure that none of their, and this is mainly federal grants, none of their federal funding is paying for lobbying efforts. And if you have an approved IDC agreement, then that would be attached. And they will also sometimes request a proof of your financial management controls, proof of a financial management administration policy. And then there are other supporting documents, depending on the granting agency, they will identify other things that they want to see and to be part of this grant application. So that's just a, a brief overview. It looks like a lot. Um, I'm really trying not to say that word. Um, it just is not my favorite word, but there I go. We have a quick question about what IDC stands for. I'll be, I can go over, it's coming up. I'm going into a little bit more detail so I can go cover that in, uh, I believe it's item G or F, okay? So let's look at a sample and this is a sample from the Department of Justice. This was just released earlier this year and it has already closed. So we have that the Department of Justice wanted applicants to submit a cover sheet. And these are, I captured these words verbatim, but I took out a lot of real specific um, text that I did not want to include. So these would highlight and be the highlights that convey a really good example of how detailed some grant applications can be. So here we have a, an application cover sheet, and basically it's an abstract. They identify how many words, and normally it's just a one page or half page, or you, or you make it fit in their little box online. A tribal community and justice profile. This number in red, the 30% in this NOVA, stated that 30% of their points would be dependent on how well this is written, how much information is conveyed about your community. And there's a lot more writing under this paragraph, but these are the highlights, like I said. C is the purpose area narrative, and that accounts for 50% of the points that are going to be awarded for this grant application. And they provide a template, and that template covers that template covers your project or program design. So this is if you're designing, let's say a domestic violence program and you have, you're going to design a program to create a new advocate's position and they're going to focus on safety of domestic violence victims that are stuck at home. How are we gonna create and improve our communication with them and make sure that they're continually safe. So that's how you start looking at that and you start thinking, okay, we need to hire a person, they're gonna need a vehicle, they're gonna need extra safety equipment um, for themselves or safety supplies for themselves. And then we're gonna distribute supplies for them. We're gonna leave them with, with our participants in our program. So this is how they're gonna travel and this is what they're gonna have safety and they're going to provide they're going to promote safety they're going to promote state um covid safety and they're going to make sure that they have improved communication and find ways to keep that communication open when you start explaining that you also have to make sure that you convey that you're going to be capable you have the capacity 
and those that you hire have the competency to carry out this program idea and to build it. If it's new, you have the core competencies where you're planning for them in the staff that you want to hire. And the other is the evaluation. And so you need to identify the ways you're, like I had mentioned earlier, how you're going to measure the impact. What outcomes are you expecting? And how are we going to show that? And that's creating data collection, pre and post information. So D is the application should also include a timeline. And here, it only accounts for 5% of the, the points that they're going to provide if an app score application. They provide a template. They are looking to make sure that all your grant activities are somehow conveyed in this timeline. These are really tricky. It, it, it takes a really good creative, um, maybe a linear thinker to think of all the steps and to put, put all the dates and then it says that you assign them to the different people. If you don't already have their names, you have their job title and you put a new position's name there and then hopefully target dates. And they, they like to see for this grant that you're identifying a one month time within the quarter, not necessarily specific dates because depending on when grants are actually awarded, depending on when you actually roll it out, um, it's better to say within a month after award, within the first quarter of award, then that gives you, it's a moving date that keeps moving depending on when they're actually awarding the funding. And then E, which is my favorite part of a budget, of a grant is the budget. But there's always, I should say, there's normally two parts of the budget. And here it only accounts for 15%. I think it should be like 40, 50, but here it's 15%. The Department of Justice and their announcements um, have, have been providing funds for grant awards for years. So they're very advanced on how they oversee their grant process. So they have developed worksheets, they have developed forms that automatically fill and in this document it automatically calculates total so they want you to use their worksheet and that's pretty nice if you don't like to like recalculate and calculate there was a time where we had to hand calculate all of the budgets and this was probably dating myself but that's okay i have many years of experience but there was a time where we had to create a worksheet but it had to have so many columns and we had to add them all up and, and we didn't have work spreadsheets back then. <laughs> but we've come along so far. So under the paragraph E, it just explains that there are two parts. There's the detail worksheet where you actually show all of your calculations, you write out your whole formula, how many days, how much money per day, equals what? How many items of this are you buying? How much does it cost? What's the total? Um, then the other part is a budget narrative. And they always want the story about the budget is what the narrative is about. Well, we are going to, if we stay with the domestic violence example, the new program manager will be uh, traveling so many miles per week to, to transport, no, we can't say, can't really say the transporting, or, or we could, maybe that's the important thing is to safely transport participants of the program or to transport supplies and um, essentials to our participants of the program. And so that's how you start saying, okay, based on that information that they're going to be driving or transporting so many miles. So we'll calculate fuel, the cost of the vehicle, the insurance, and include those items in the budget. 
They always want to make sure that it's cost effective, that it's allowable, that it's allocable, and it's legal. Sometimes in this application here, there isn't a requirement for matching funds, but when there is, there's usually another column or a section that explains how much you're going to be putting into the grant budget. How much funding are you contributing? How much of your time? How much of your expenses? How much are you, what parts of the program are you covering to meet that match requirement? F is the tribal authority to apply. And this is if you're a tribal organization or a tribal entity, you need to have the proof that you have a resolution. They usually want a resolution. And then again, um, I just highlighted this T because it was a lowercase T, but that's one of my pet peeves is a lot of documents do not capitalize tribe and yet they're, they're equal nations. So we should always capitalize tribe if that's the if that's the language that you're going to use in your grant application. It's just my little effort to to recognize our sovereignty of nations. But here's the green part I highlighted as support, and that's the match because they whoever's approving you to go after these funds is also creating a, a relationship, a, a commitment, an exchange. You are awarded grant funding. This is what we are agreeing to provide. We are actually making a contract that if we are accepting these federal funds, if we're accepting these foundation funds, if we're accepting these funds from this other entity that is trusting us to do what we said we were going to do, this is what we are committing to. And so that's the support and commitment that I think is important when you are receiving authority to apply. G is the disclosure of the high risk status and kind of covered that already. There are the designations that may disqualify, seemingly disqualify an applicant, but sometimes you do get approved and there's just some stipulation attached in the contract award. And H is the disclosure of pending applications. I also already went into that before, just to make sure that we are not, it is not seen as an inappropriate duplication. You're not asking for funding from two sources for the same thing, because that would not be ethical. Um, you also have to adjust the non-supplanting assurance to your funding agency that you're not getting money to already fund something that you already have money to, to um, spend on. Like, I'm the boss and I want more money, so I'm just going to, I'm making 20000 now and I want to make forty, so I'm going to get 20000 but I'm still doing the same job. You know, it, it's very... It's a very fine line of what is supplanting. If it's existing now and you're adding to it, you should be doing more, not just doing the same thing, but getting money. And that would not be appropriate with federal funds. Okay, there's a disclosure of lighting activities is item I. And that's standard for most federal applications. And K, we have the free award. I don't have IDC here, but let's keep going on that. I'll address the IDC. Pre award risk assessment questions, and this is very specific to this Department of Justice grant. So they'll, depending, like I said, depending on the granting agency, they may throw in specific, very specific um, forms questionnaires, surveys, they may want a initial intent letter, things like that. So this one's very specific to the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice also has 
an OJP financial management and system of internal controls questionnaire, but they also have training specifically for their financial management system. So if you obtain grant funding from the Department of Justice, they will fund and require someone to attend their financial management portion of grants when you when you have received your grant funding. So it's very important that they um, train and know that you've been trained to manage their grant funding. So under other, there are some other items that they may request or that may be helpful in supporting what you're trying to obtain money for. I think all of these documents, if, if, they're, if you're allowed attachments, make them strong, make them support and help you convey as an, in another way that you're capable of doing what you're proposing. Letters of support from other entities, letters of support from those that you're you're proposing to assist. Um, letters of support from the, that community, from that um, youth group, from those elders in the area. Those are really helpful to show that you've, you've communicated your program idea and it has support from your community that you're proposing to provide this service in. And I put, a, I put my note in blue that says, a um, letter of support or a petition of support. And that's, I make a note not to do that in a casino because you can't have petitions in case they're union based petitions. It just assists a red flag. So don't use that word in a casino setting if that's where you're trying to obtain like signatures for support of your grant. So that's a lesson learned. They may want to see resumes of your key personnel, those that are ruling out this program. They want to see what their backgrounds are, what their education, have they done this before. That all supports and shows your competency uh, or the success of the proposed project. If it's a new position, they want to see job descriptions. And, and if you're really good and have some background in HR, you can whip out those job descriptions real quick and tie them into your program goals and objectives so that it's very cohesive. And hopefully you have an HR department that can, that can sit down with you and you can talk about what you need and they can draft something and you get it finalized to be included in a grant application in a timely, timely manner. Memorandum understanding with your partners if there's someone that you're going to work closely with, maybe in a, a similar agency in a nearby community, uh, this is really helpful with domestic violence programs. If there's another agency outside that you can place um, your clients in with in another community and you have that agreement set up, that would be a great memorandum of, of understanding. And if they're going to contribute their time they're actually going to contribute funds, then you have a memorandum of agreement saying this is what we're agreeing, how we're agreeing to work together in the future on this program. Again, a letter of non-supplanting or a confidential notice, confidentiality agreement. Um, we're not giving out any confidential business information. This is not, we're not, we're going to be cognizant of participant um, personal information. You may be working with patients of like a, a diabetes program and wellness program. Those that participate, you're protecting their, their information. That's the type of confidentiality notice that may be required. And documentations of collaboration, how you're collaborating with anybody outside of this program. So let's go back and talk about the IDC agreement. And that stands for an indirect cost agreement. You have, it, it's a very formal process. You submit your, your operating cost, and you identify those that are shared by all programs. And through this whole process with the Office of the Inspector General, 
it helps to identify a percentage. And that percentage of your operating costs, overhead, indirect costs, whatever you put into that pool that is shared by all of your programs, then that percentage is, is documented in a formal agreement with the federal government. It gets their approval and we say, okay, a standard average number for tribal organizations is right around, I'd say 20 to 30 percent. Some have been as high as 50 percent and I've, I've heard that some universities are as high as 80 percent. So just depending on your agency, that would be a formal agreement. And so you can apply that IDC to that grant budget and always set that portion aside to do the work that you're doing. And that covers uh, IDC cost pool items may include your payroll, your finance, your maintenance, uh, utilities, building space. If it's shared by everybody, if it's not shared, it can be specific, then it doesn't go in your indirect cost pool. Your executive uh, deputy director, HR. So those types of things that it, it's, it's a cost that's shared by the whole organization usually go into the indirect cost pool. And there are CPAs and accountants who love to do those. So if, if that's something that needs to be done and updated every year. I hope that answered your question about me. So those last three so slides were a little bit more detailed about what should be included in the application. So the third part of what's included in your guiding document, in the guiding documents, in the NOFA, the RFA, the FOA, is the process of accepting the grant award. So if, should you, when you receive your grant award, there'll be a formal process of accepting the grant, especially if it's a federal grant, well, any grant really, you should be returning a signed document that says, thank you, I accept these grant monies. I agree to blah. And that's where you need to be aware of what your, what the, what the agreement is that you're going to abide by certain policies, administrating policy, reporting policies. So it just, brought back a memory of one of the first grants that we wrote was for uh, several years ago when I was in partnership, we wrote a Department of Energy grant for a tribe out on the West Coast. And it was a solar, huge megawatt solar array. And it was a, it was a multi-million dollar project. We learned a lot about solar arrays for that project and the the tribe was awarded the grant. And we had written, it was, it was a business learning experience also. We had agreed because the tribe didn't have money to pay us up front that we would agree to payment when we showed that we could do the work, that we were successful, and that they were awarded the grant. And that the grant was awarded. That was the kicker. The grant was awarded and the tribe received funds, but it got hung up because the tribe had changed the executive directors and that piece of grant award notice went to this desk where the director was no longer sitting in and this new director set up a new email, a new desk, and waited for the piece of paper to hit over here. Miss the granting agency resent a second notice. You're getting this grant award. You're, you have this solar array project approved. Tick tock, tick tock, nothing. Okay, grant rescinded, reawarded somewhere else and the tribe finds the document. So because the grant 
was awarded, but the tribe didn't actually receive the money, we didn't receive the pay. So there is a formal acceptance award process. So please figure out, pay attention. Once you submit your grant application, know what the steps are, know how the granting agency is going to communicate your, your award. That's really important. And know, I hate to say strings attached, but sometimes it feels that way. Know that there's going to be reporting requirements. If it's a federal grant, you may be required to abide by drug-free workplace if you don't already or tobacco-free. There may be some um, registration, national registration institute like sex offender registration that you really have to be aware of. You have to be aware of background checks. Um, just those things that are attached upon grant award, pay attention to your grant award document and know what they're requiring you to report on. Know from the beginning what you need to start tracking. Do they want to know or do you want to count? How many clients do you assist? How many hours per client? What kind of services? Those types of things. How do you set your baseline to start making those measurements? And how are you setting up your accounting to make sure that your financial reports are going to be accurate? There's a review process and that someone is on it and they're making sure that those grant financial reports coincide with the narrative, saying the same thing, supporting each other and being submitted as required. Hopefully that's the smooth part of the grant process, the tail end of accepting the money and keeping it, keeping compliance. Here's an example, and I put the easy button here because this is all they want for you to submit. There's a donation guideline. This is a donation. If you want to request an online donation, you just fill out the form online and you could hear back from them within eight to ten weeks easy here's a grant request guideline that says just follow these guidelines they want a detailed description of the grant and how the funding will be used they want a budget justification and they don't provide a form the if there's an organization located on the reservation they would like to see a resolution and if the tribal government or, or if it's not a tribal government or 50C3, then they want to know who your fiscal agent is. So those are ideal. Not a lot of them out there with this, just this short little type of, of request for information to request funding. But I thought it was, you know, after going through those pages and pages of instructions, it's good to know that some of these are out there, but these would be more on the foundations and charitable giving sites. So let's talk about where, where do we find these grant announcements and how do we start looking for them? So there are the GuideStar nonprofit directory and you subscribe and you set up your free account, but then they start you know, asking for subscription and, and promoting that. But if you're in that profession of looking for grants, grant research, and that's your job, then it would be good to subscribe. If you're a federal funding agent, federal program that is eligible for funding through a lot of federal websites or www.grants.gov, is the federal government's database and it has all of their current funding opportunities listed. We'll take a look at that in one of the next screens. There are also tribes. There are several charitable tribal nations out there. There might be local communities and businesses in your community that have giving programs. And then you can always just do a Google search. So let's take a look at a resource that I really like to pay attention to 
you can find it at um, the HUD website. It's called, well, there's a the web address there for you. It's called Hotalk, and it's the HUD Tribal Program Newsletter. If you look at that, the first column under their newsletter section three, you have an agency source, their target deadline, and a little summary about what they're funding. So here on this page, you see the tribal energy development capacity. It says there will be about 15 grants ranging from 10,000 to a million to Indian tribes, Alaska Natives, a tribal energy resource development organization. And feasibility studies are always needed by our tribes. What is the feasibility of um, solar, feasibility of wind, and the Department of Energy has all that information and a lot more on their website. There are funds available for, that's titled under the Native American Business Development Institute, and this really looks at opportunity zones under economic development, and the, if you're in these zones, there's special considerations for federal funding. So it's good to know about that. On another page, we see energy technology on tribal lands. And these, again, are for, I believe it's for tribes, Indian tribes, and authorized tribal organizations. It would be good to find out how you get authorized as a tribal organization to be eligible for those funds. There's food programs. And because it's a HUD newsletter, there's a lot of HUD housing, and that's where their housing authorities, public and tribal, are the only applicants that may be eligible. But this list shows several funding, federal funding sources. <clears throat> And there's a lot of money in their roads. So if you're a roads program, you look down at that rural and transit passenger technical assistance money. Might be interesting. On this page, there's a community facilities fund. And under that one, we had worked with a, a university and I wrote a program for community facilities and equipment for a tribal, a small tribal college. There's always water grant, water funding, it seems, through USDA, rural business development grants, but that usually goes through the SBA or their RDBOs. Um, there has been money for infrastructure, a lot of rural broadband, IT, um, telehealth funding has come out because of the virus. There always seems to be VA loans, but they're so technical, it's it's really competitive. So just looking at this variety of funding sources on those pages were from the HUD Hotel newsletter. And you saw the website that you can log on to to see that and they update it every month. This screenshot that's on the screen now is from www.grants.gov. And this is the database that the US government utilizes and, and you can access freely to see all of the federal grant opportunities that are in various stages. So you pay attention. I, I did a search this morning for tribal business and these are the top opportunities I like they, they see them as funding opportunities. So you see there's a funding number, the title, the agency that's host that's providing the funding and the status. And you pay attention to the closing date because that's the date that grant applications are due. So these um, highlighted opportunity numbers on the website, you click on them and it takes you to another page that says, this is what we're funding. These are who are eligible. Click here for the next 
NOFA, and, and then you'll bring up something that looks like what we just reviewed for the Department of Justice, that whole list of eligibility criteria, that whole list of what your grant should look like and all the attachments and then the grant board information and contact. That's what most of these links will take you to. This is also a screenshot from grants.gov because they're a large funder of our national programs, federally funded programs. There's a lot of resources that I wanted to make sure you were aware of. You can go onto their website and view their grant writing tips, little um, video. You can learn more about grants.gov and you can also learn about how you use their workspace because it's an online sharing of documents uh, virtually from desk to desk of those that you give authority to work together as your team on that workspace. It's really, really cool. One thing that uh, is a lesson learned is that you need to have the correct Adobe, uh, here it says Adobe software compatibility. That's very important. We were submitting a grant and it, the time was ticking. I think it was 11.59 Eastern Standard Time. So in the Midwest, that was two hours earlier. So at 10, and it was 9.50 some. And we kept trying to upload, kept trying to upload. But what we didn't <clears throat> see was behind our work screen, there was another app opening up and closing, opening up, up and opening up and closing. And it was preventing us from uploading our document and so at the 11th and a half hour we were calling the IT guy from that company and he says I can see he remoted in he's I can see there's another screen open where do you have that open and we said no we don't we really have this one so he said close that screen or, or reduce it and there it was there was another acrobat version that was opening and closing so we shut that off and then uploaded so it's just you know, know your laptop, have your headphones and microphone ready, I guess should have been my lesson, but um, know what Acrobat version you have and whether or not it's compatible with grants.gov or the application, especially if it's online uh, application process. So just a lesson learned there. You also have the various websites for each agency that may be online. For example, this is the endowment for the humanities. There's another endowment for the arts and they have their listing of their grant programs based on what they fund. So this is a summary of what the National Endowment for Humanities funds. Challenge programs, digital, you, you can read this list. I don't need to read it. But if you just Google a lot of those agencies, there are several resources that can come up. And this section of the OTOP newsletter was also very helpful. So I wanted to just have these uh, website addresses available to you to look at if you want to pursue any of that information, uh, grant opportunities. Some of the um, ones that I like would be this here, the federal register. Oops, how did I get back over there? My brain's going a little faster. Okay, let's see. I wanted to go highlight here. The federal register today. Um, grants available to tribes on health issues. So there are there are a lot of sites and information that are online that you could Google. This is a, a just to acknowledge that there are charitable tri charitable tribes out there that have money that they have formalized their charitable giving program. This is the Shakopee, the Wakatan Sioux community, and they have a giving program, like it says here, 
they have given over $350 million to different programs. And they have this simple online form to submit. So that's a charitable tribe in Minnesota. There's also the Sam and Well Band of Mission Indians in California. And they're located and like to, to provide um, charitable giving to San Bernardino and Riverside. But if you look here, they also like to provide funding to tribal government and tribal nonprofits. I can't highlight organizations throughout the United States. This is a list of their eligibility. So give them a look. The only bad thing about this year right now is it's kind of like in the tail end of the year, funding year. So if you look on the goal section, you see that their grant period, grant application period is closed right now. But they will be starting up again in February. So let's look at when it is a good time to write grants. And I made a little visual here of us being here in the red. This is September. So normally federal funding programs from that applied last year, they will be maybe getting in the grant award. Those are the happy faces with dollar signs. So the federal government should be awarding grant funds for the upcoming federal fiscal year that starts October 1st. So October 1st, the new grantees will be starting their, their project. But for us, as we sit here in September, and we know that funding cycle goes on, the federal funding year goes on, a lot of other foundations and community giving programs try to mimic this, but they may have their own calendar, but I wanted to go with this federal funding year because there's a lot of money in our federal um, grants.gov. So I have the blue ideas thinking, okay, we should be thinking of what we want to or need as programs, what we can plan for, what we can start developing, we start drafting our budgets and getting approval. We start look for these NOFAs in um, December here. Let's look for the NOFAs that should be coming out in November, maybe January. And then we start needing to work together in February, March, and April 2021 to start writing and applying and, and target dates for applications that might be due um, as late as May and June, but pay attention to the NOFA, the RFA, the Notice of Available Funding, Funding in the FOA, they will have these specific dates. But every year, the federal government funding, you hear about those budget meetings, you hear about um, continuing resolutions, you hear about what funding is being changed, what new proposed funding program funds are being made available. So every time there's that discussion on, in our news, we look to the government to provide who's eligible for this funding and how you access this money and who's eligible. And then they start this whole federal funding program because then they need to distribute the money, but how do they do that fairly through the grants.gov if it's not already identified who's receiving those funds, they have to announce it, they have to contract it, and they follow this process every federal year. So these are some targeted um, grant season workers every year we go through this process. So now let's go back to the why. Uh, I, I like to tie these whys back to your, whether it's a personal, a business, an organizational, tribal program, council program, board, vision, mission, goal, objectives, and timeline. How do these tie into your grant applications and why is it important? And as we hear back about the why, I'm going to listen to see if they match up. 
So, Marcia, do you have a summary of the flies? Marcia? Oh, no, Marcia, sorry. Do you have a summary of the flies, Heather? Sorry, I wasn't aware that I was supposed to be collecting something. So is that the answer, the question that people answered in the very beginning? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, in terms of why I saw all, all kinds of responses, um, a lot of people looking for grants specifically for their business, uh, particularly uh -huh. businesses in tribal communities. Um, and I, from personally knowing some of the people who wrote responses, I know that um, some of them want to um, expand the social and the community aspects of their, their business as well. We have some agricultural folks, some arts agencies, um, people who just see problems in their communities like electricity access, water access, and just trying to figure out how could they help their community secure money to fix some of those challenges. And then um, some folks on nonprofit boards who want to learn more about grant writing for nonprofits. Oh, okay. Great. So just looking at, a, a, at part of those, sometimes communities need to look at who is applying for those grants and how is the tribe applying for these grant for these pots of money and how do we make sure that our voices as communities are being are being heard we often hear of public hearings or public meeting that's where the tribal departments are supposed to come out to the community and gather their input and make sure that it's written into their plan and if they're if we're not sure Going up for those meetings and we're tired feeling like we're not heard then that's where breakdown may communications and breakdown may happen but just looking at and, and learning about the federal budget and grant process and knowing that these are ongoing that the federal government programs if, if our tribal offices or departments are already receiving these funds we need to become aware of how they're supposed to be compliant with public information, soliciting public input, because that's usually a big part of those memorandums of understanding, those um, proof that there's community support. As for um, water access, electricity, being aware of what Department of Energy has available, sometimes there are opportunities to for community action groups to, to partner our um, energy organizations. I, I've been hearing that there are more and more uh, tribal companies out there. And so find, I know that finding the right company that fits with your goal and partnering would be something that would be awesome to see is to draw from that already established business, um, electrical water, natural gas, whatever it might be to create that that change and, and knowing how to communicate your need. It might be developing a need statement for your community so that you can hand it to as a draft, something not real formal yet, but as a draft to help you convey your communities and see who buys and say, we want to be a partner. We need to address this one. We want to be a part of that grant application to the Department of Energy. Um, it might be setting up a, a nonprofit. I know my nephew has, has started working with a nonprofit that they, they've been working on weekends on this, like it looks like an old ice cream truck, but they're filling it with these bicycle parts. And on the weekend, they go biking, mountain biking, but they drive this old ice cream truck with these parts in it and they help to repair kids' bikes out throughout the web that were the biking. And what a great community service that is and it promotes um, exercise and gets the kids outside and that's really important right now with the virus and making sure we have burning that energy instead of feeling like we're stuck inside 
this and I thought what a great idea to map our youth and it was just just great idea so that might be you know a seed a thought how how these things can happen um if you're on a nonprofit board it's really good to to know that writing grant isn't easy it really is time consuming and if you find a good grant writer, hang on to them. Um, sometimes part of grant writing is part of your fundraising and your own in your internal maybe capital campaign program, knowing that where you might be eligible for these foundation grants and having a, a pre-drafted application ready when opportunities come up or you need something that could really be part of your your giving program. So those are some ways that I can think of as far as what would be uh, useful to know about the grant process. So when we look at our vision, our mission, our goals, and objectives and timelines, if you're a business and you have these items already in your business plan, then it's really, it should be easy to use those pieces for your grant application if it's a really good fit. And if you don't have these pieces, then I would encourage you to do some planning, to sit down with you and your leadership, your constituents, to sit down and say, what is our big idea? What do we want to accomplish? What do we want to work towards? Because this is how I see a vision. It's not going to be accomplished in my lifetime, but I want to work towards it. I always think of Miss America, world peace. I want to work towards world peace, but I know it's not going to happen in my lifetime. So during my lifetime, what is my mission? I want to promote improvements that will help us live and be in more harmony. How do we do that? I want to provide a webinar and help people learn how to get access to this money that's out there and help them improve their skill at writing this grant application so that they can prove what they see is they're the calling that they're, they're compassionate about what you're compassionate about and when you get done there's somebody out there that needs help so let's let's figure out a program and let's find funding for it um, so we're working towards world peace but during this time and this is our mission, so we're going to help um, five families that are dealing with domestic violence. We're going to assist youth in getting outside and getting the fresh air they need, but still being safe. We're going to work for the solar program and maybe teach people about how to access solar funds and have a standard plan about the average size of a home. This is what the solar solar panels you'll need. This is the cost. This is what can help with um, gardening. So gardening has, has reignited because of the virus, and I see that as a plus for us. I've never had an actual real garden for years. This year, I had corn and squash and some flowers. So it's been really awesome. And I thought, who else is doing this? We should, we should be helping each other to get more of our community gardens. And there's funding out there for that. So. That's just what I would see as a win-win. People always talk about that this is a win-win for me and you. But how do we add another win where it's a win for our community, a win for our culture, a win for our language, whatever your goal or vision is that you want to work towards, how is it a win-win-win? So that's what I could share for today. I, I'm, I'm almost probably out of time. But I wanted to ask if there were any, give time for any questions you may have. So feel free to ask any questions and then I'll give my best answer. We have a recurring question about whether or not they, the slides are going to be emailed out. I think a part of that also has to do with the audio issue, which we'll try and fix in post production. Um, so Darlene, are these slides that we can share with uh, the people registered for this event? Definitely, definitely. 
I, I want to share as much information as I can. Um, I wanted to say thank you. There is my contact information and I'm hoping that you'll be able to share the PowerPoint with everyone that that attended today and I'm just really thankful and I apologize for the audio <laughs> difficulties also. Um, but yes, give me a call if you have any questions and want to talk some more about any of this grant information. One more question from Charmaine Yazi. She asks if you know of any resources for school or education, specifically elementary. The, there are, um, Department of Education has a lot of grant opportunities. If you go to grants.gov and just do a search for um, elementary education, that'll show you what is funded. Um, most of the time, the federal grants are only limited to uh, what they call is lead educational institutions. So um, just knowing where that funding is going and how it gets to you would be something to learn and how you can make sure it gets down to your level or if you do have the funds and you just don't understand how they're being spent, that might be something to learn too. But I can, I can search for more information for elementary school. I'm sure there's, there's CARES Act money for that because if there's um, at home learning, virtual online learning, learning, there should be money in different pockets also. Maybe that might be helpful. Perfect. We also have another question. Do you think that there's a market need for grant writers um, in more industries like a nonprofit organization? Looks like it's somebody who's thinking about becoming a grant writer. Do you feel like there's a market opportunity there? Definitely. I definitely do. Um, and the more specific and the more technical grant writing is what a lot of um, federal agencies look for or, or tribal programs. They, I would say they would be looking for grant writers that can put together economic development types of uh, funds to fund like your um, construction projects, capital campaign projects, economic development projects for developing a business site. Um, I always stress planning, but tribes tribes don't do a lot of planning, but it's so needed. Uh, but once those things are done, the, there is a, the technical side of grant writing and there's also um, turnover in grant writing positions for tribes and tribes try to, to fund that position. Uh, not so much consulting unless unless there is you know a definite relationship that you build so a lot of the the grant writing contracts that i've been able to secure have been built over the years so it's like you have to show that you're there and try to investing in you and that you're going to be successful well then i'm going to hand it back to my colleague marcia to see if she has any closing thoughts and then we'll end this webinar thank you so much darlene Thank you, thank you um, Change Labs for the opportunity to sh just share and I'm just really thankful for the opportunity to, to feel like I'm able to help have, share some of my, my personal experiences and encourage you to seek funding from the government or the foundations or any charitable government uh, agency. So good luck if you do. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, before you head off, just note that Change Labs offers webinars usually about twice a month these days. So if you go to nativestartup.org backslash events, you will see a list of the coaching sessions and also the workshops that we're offering in the coming months. And now I'm going to hand it over to Marsha over at Change Labs. Hi everyone, thank you for attending. I just wanted to do a, a little announcement. Our next webinar is going to be on October 7th, same time as um, today's webinar, 11 a.m. MDT Mountain Daylight Time or 10 a.m. Uh, Phoenix Mountain Standard Time. Uh, our speaker at that time will be Jeremiah Bitsui. Um, he will share his entrepreneur journey with us. So. Uh, please feel free to sign up at nativestartup.org forward slash events. And we will see you next time. Bye.